Hey guys, welcome to Bookish Islander. My name is Juan. I hope you're all doing very well. Today, I'm here to talk to you about every book I read in January. The Idiot is a novel by Elif Batuman in which a student protagonist goes to college for the first time, meets boys for the first time, learns Russian for the first time, meets a lot of people with different backgrounds, mostly Europeans, Central Europeans, for the first time. A lot of people from that kind of background have a beef with Turkish people and with Turkey and as it happens the protagonist of this book is although she is American she is of Turkish extraction so there is a lot of conflict there in the novel deriving from that the problem is that as an American she's not really aware of all that intricate history of the Ottoman Empire in Turkey so very often she doesn't understand why people have certain ideas about her now at some point in the novel she travels to the area uh, because she wants to teach English as part of a project that they're all doing you know comedy ensues this is a funny novel it's a novel that I enjoyed greatly because I loved the voice of the character narrator she's someone from my generation so she went to college in the 1990s the same as I did so some of her problems dealing with technology for instance it, the novel begins in fact with her being given being assigned an email address by the university and she doesn't really understand what email is. So this is not a millennial novel at all, although it's published recently and it has young characters. Make no mistakes, the characters in this novel are not millennials. They belong to my generation. The novel is set in the 1990s. The whole conceit of using emails is used and it's exploited and it really works. It can get a little bit tiresome after a while, but the best thing about this novel is the narrator's voice and that's why I'd recommend it. Olive Again is a follow-up to Olive Kitteridge by Elizabeth Strout. Now, I read Olive Kitteridge last year and I absolutely loved it. However, when I heard that Olive Again was coming out, I was a little bit skeptical. I wasn't sure if it would be worth my time because, you know, maybe I'm a little bit cynical, but I thought that because of the success of HBO's adaptation of the first book, Elizabeth Strout was making a move here to make a quick buck out of readers who love the first book. Perhaps a lot of them actually went to the first book because of the miniseries. I know that was the case with me. I watched the show a couple of years ago and that's what made me want to read Olive Kitteridge. I was convinced, however, by some comments from viewers of my channel to give Olive again a chance, and I'm so glad I did. I mean, is this book really necessary? I don't know, but it furthers the adventures you get more from Olive Kitteridge, and she's still to her best. There is character development, and I was so glad that I got to spend a few more hours with this character. I must say, though, that as it is the case with the first book, in this one I feel like the stories or the vignettes that star Olive Kitteridge are the strongest. I didn't care so much for everyone else in her town. I only cared about them if they interacted with her, but maybe that's just me. Or maybe that's just the problem when you create as a writer a really charismatic character that readers will fall in love with. Exhalation by Ted Chunk is a collection of science fiction short stories. So before I go into that, let me tell you that I am not at all a big reader of science fiction. So I don't know if I will do this book justice. However, I'm going to tell you what I thought about it, what my impressions were as a non-science fiction uh, reader. And I think that's important important because you know you may not be a detective fiction reader or a science fiction reader does that mean that you can't possibly read a book that belongs to those genres I don't think so I think everyone could read anything and everyone's opinion is valid as long as it's based on the text that they read so here's my opinion on exhalation okay so as I said it's a collection of short stories and the short stories grapple with the big philosophical questions of today you know technology uh, memory you know there are so many interesting themes here and I think that's what good science fiction does but again I'm not a big um, science fiction reader so don't add me. I felt a little bit underwhelmed I must say about this collection and it could possibly do with my expectations. You know, I kind of expected something more dystopian, more negative, considering the world that we're actually living in at the moment and the world that we're, we're living in in 2019. Nothing has actually changed so far in 2020, but you know, it's only early February, so let's hope. But you know, I expected something a little bit more dystopian, you know, and I was surprised by how optimistic some of the outlook in some of the stories at least is. However, would I recommend this short story collection? 
I would. I thought it was very well written. Uh, I'd be curious to know what people who are into science fiction would make out of it though. And I guess I was in the mood for something that deals with discoveries and dealing with new civilizations and that kind of thing because I couldn't find that on Ted Cheng's uh, exhalation. So I went to a Spanish play from the 17th century called Los Guanches de Tenerife, which is a play, a dramatized version of the conquest of my native island of Tenerife. As you may or may not know, Tenerife was conquered by Spanish forces in 1496. Okay, so that's quite a few years uh, after the discovery, the so-called discovery of the Americas. And, you know, the conquest was brutal. The Spaniards made several attempts. Uh, the first two were unsus unsuccessful. The, finally, the third one was successful. They had already conquered the other surrounding islands, so they got help from natives from those islands. This is similar to the conquest of Mexico in many ways. There are many parallels here. So what is this play, Los Guanches de Tenerife? Well, guanches mean, is a word that means men in the local language. So it's a word that is used to refer to the natives of Tenerife and more widely the natives or the, um, rather than the natives, I want to say the indigenous peoples of the Canary Islands, okay? So everything that we have, all the written accounts from the conquest and the, you know, the colonization come from the winners, come from Europeans, not just from the, the Spanish, but also from the French and, and, and so on, you know. So it's interesting uh, because, it, well, it's not interesting really, it's rather sad because we don't have the indigenous people's account of what's going on, right? So this doesn't give you that, obviously. It's a Spanish play written by a Spanish writer, Lope de Vega. He's one of the, I would say he's the most important playwright in Spain, or at least one of them, okay? one of the most important one. He is, he was contemporaneous with Shakespeare, okay? So that will give you an idea if you're more used to English literature. So in his place, he just recounts how the conquest we, uh, went and he romanticizes it. There's this symbolic union between a conqueror and an indigenous girl, a princess. Uh, the book was a lot of fun. Being from Tenerife, I liked it. I rolled my eyes a couple of times because it's really clear that Lope de Vega never set foot on the Canary Islands. So he talks about animals and plants that actually did not exist here before the conquest and before Europeans brought them over. But this was a lot of fun to read. Garth Greenwell wrote Cleanness as a follow-up to his previous novel, What Belongs to You. Now, I haven't read What Belongs to You and that is perhaps a mistake I made because this new novel, which only recently came out, follows the adventures of the same character. So I wasn't familiar with this character, so there were a few things about him that didn't quite make sense to me or I couldn't understand. And perhaps if I read What Belongs to You first, I would have gotten more out of this novel. But now it's too late to find out. Okay, so what is cleanness? Cleanness follows the sexual adventures, discoveries, and the love life of, the, of an American expat, an American teacher teaching English, an English teacher from America who lives in Bulgaria of all places. You know, one of the problems I had was really understanding why he was there and maybe that becomes clear if I read what belongs to you. However, I think there's just some um, autobiographical element. I believe that Garth himself, Garth Greenwell, went to Bulgaria and was an English teacher there. So perhaps, you know, I'm pretty sure that that's why he chose that place. I was a little bit underwhelmed by this novel, I must say. Uh, there was too much explicit sex and I don't enjoy that. Not because I'm a, I'm a prude, I don't think I am, but it's because I find written accounts of sexual acts really dull to read and I don't care whether they're straight, gay or anything else. I don't care about the gender identity of the characters involved on those sexual scenes. I just find really long, drawn out sexual scenes really boring to read. And that was my problem with this book. I think I would have preferred it if it had been a more introspective narrative. The book, however, has those elements of introspection and those to me were the strongest part of this book. And it's why I would recommend it if you're already interested to read something like this. Chess Story is a novella written in the 1940s by the Austrian writer Stefan Zweig. 
and you know it's very short it is really a novella it's a little bit too long to be considered a short story but it's way too short to be considered a novel i really like this i'm a big fan of stefan zweig i'm slowly making my way through his writing last year i read um the world of yesterday which is nonfiction, and i absolutely loved it so i this year in 2020 i want to read some of his fiction some of his nonfiction. so far i have to say that i'm more into his nonfiction which is interesting because I'm more of a fiction writer than I am nonfiction. He writes amazingly. He's a writer I think that everyone should read and that's not something that I often say. I think you know there are writers or there are specific books for specific people. With this one however I think it's for everyone. This novel is for everyone. This novella chess story and his nonfiction is most definitely for everyone. So what is the chess story about well sometimes a game of chess it's a lot more than a game of chess and that's all I'm gonna say because I think if I said anything else about the plot of this novella I would be spoiling it and I wouldn't want to do that I wouldn't want to spoil the fun and the pure joy of reading Stefan Zweig's uh, chess story or anything else really that he wrote. As part of my Booker Through the Decades project I read A Brief History of Seven Killings by Marlon James. I started this book a couple of months ago. I started it late in 2019. It took me a while to get through it. I find it a bit of a slog to be honest but I would say that people who love this novel and a lot of people love it really truly love it. Okay so don't at me because I didn't like it. I think it's a great novel. I think it's masterfully constructed and I think a lot of people would love this novel and I know that a lot of people who have read it actually love it. So what is it about? It's about geopolitical intrigue in Jamaica. It follows the decades after the attempted assassination of the famous reggae singer and composer Bob Marley. It's told through many different voices which can make it quite confusing. You have to keep the characters and the different voices straight in your head and it's you know you should read each of those voices in a different voice in your head because you have American characters and Jamaican characters and they all speak in a very specific way and that's one of the best things about this novel how masterfully Marlon James achieves that really effortlessly it seems but you know as I said I find it a bit of a slog so I'm sorry if you love this novel done at me I think it's still great I would recommend it if you're interested in Jamaica or if you uh, like reggae music and Bob Marley or if you like narratives with many different voices then this is the novel for you otherwise stay clear Strike Your Heart by Amelie Notom came out a couple of years ago I hadn't had the chance to read it I finally read it in January and I loved it it's a very short novel very intense it grabs you by the heart or by anything proverbial that you want to think about and it doesn't let you go until the very end it's about a mother who is sickly jealous of her daughter but it's interesting because the novel begins with the mother herself as a teenager before the daughter even existed or was even a thought in her head. It is a fast moving novel and if you're a big fan of Notom already this is a must read and if you don't know Notom you could do a lot worse than to begin by reading Strike Your Heart. There are some books that I feel preach to the choir when I read them but that wasn't the case with Siempre Han Hablado de Nosotras by the Catalan Moroccan writer Najat El Hashmi. Now this is a book that was originally published in Catalan. I read it in Spanish translation because I got it out of the local library. It's a very short book. It's non-fiction. It's an essay in which she talks about Islam from the perspective of a Muslim feminist or former Muslim I think uh, who lives in the West but it's a book I think that it's addressed to Western audiences, particularly European audiences. I think it's a book that if you live in a country like France or Belgium or even or Germany, I think it's worth reading. She's very critical with Islam. She explains um, a lot of the reasons why uh, Islamophobia has arisen in the West in recent years but it's not really what I expected. It kind of challenged my own way of thinking about all of these issues from a left-wing perspective. History of Violence is a second novel by Edouard Louis. Edouard Louis is a young up-and-coming French writer. He's critically acclaimed not just in the French-speaking world but also in the English-speaking world and everywhere else. 
History of Violence is a follow-up to the end of Eddie, so we have the same character but we've moved on from his origins. Now we're in Paris and one night on Christmas Eve he is the victim of a sexual assault. This book deals with the sexual assault but most importantly deals with the aftermath of that sexual assault. It's an interesting book, it is fascinating, it will challenge a lot of your misconceptions about race and sexuality in fascinating ways. It's a non-preachy book. It will grab hold of you if you pick it up. And his third book is Who Killed My Father? This is a shorter book and it reads more like an essay even though it is still out of fiction-y like the previous two books. It's a lot shorter. I read it in probably about an hour. I'm a completist so I'm glad that I read it because I read and enjoy so much his previous two books. However, I don't think it's as brilliant as the previous two books. If you've read Edouard Louis and before and you just want to complete. He's only written three books so you can really read his whole oeuvre in just one weekend I think if you're a fairly fast reader. The Dead by James Joyce is the final short story in his collection Dubliners. I read Dubliners many years ago but I wanted to go back to The Dead because it is perhaps the most famous short story in that collection. Also it is so big that it is almost a novella. It's a little bit too short to be a novella, but a little bit too long to be a short story, something in between. If you've ever lived through an awkward dinner party, well, you should read this book because this book tells of the most awkward dinner party in literature I have ever come across. Le Consentement is a French book of autofiction written by Vanessa Springora. This is her first book. In it, she tells the story of her real life relationship as a 13 and 14 year old girl with the much older writer Gabriel Matzneff who was already in the 40s. So we're going back to the 1980s, 1990s here. This book only came out a few weeks ago. It's the book of the season in France. It caused a huge scandal because as it turns out everybody knew that Gabriel Matzneff was a pedophile. He talked openly about it. Through decades he wrote many books in which he detailed his sexual exploits but people turned a blind eye. The word pedophile was never really used. People embraced him. The literary lapped up his books. He got really well reviewed in the French press and now he's been unmasked by Vanessa Springora. But the really shocking thing is that everybody knew. I was a little bit skeptical because I thought this book is a scandal. I don't know. Is it going to be good? Is it going to be exploitative? It's a really good book to read. It's as if Lolita was written from the perspective of, of Dolores Hayes. That's how good it is. You should read it. It's only available in French at the moment so if you can read in French go out and grab it. If you can't read in French I am sure that translations into other languages will be forthcoming. In The Loser by Thomas Bernhard, a musician recalls his friendship with two people who are now dead. The first one is William Gold, who's a Canadian musician who died of natural causes. And the other one, it's an Austrian musician called Wedheimer, who killed himself after, shortly after the death of his friend. This is the first book that I read by Thomas Bernhard, the Austrian author, and I loved it. I want to read absolutely everything this writer ever wrote. That's how much I loved The Loser by Thomas Bernhard. And in his novel Concrete, Thomas Bernhard tells about a writer who has writer's blog, okay? That's not the most original premise. However, wait until you hear about the rest, okay? He blames his sister for his writer's blog. So he's looking forward to his sister going away so he can focus and finally read a book that he's been working on for several years. His sister goes away and guess what happens? He cannot write a word. Lluvia Fina by Luis Landero was named as the best novel of 2019 by the Spanish newspaper El País. I can read in Spanish but I don't read that much in Spanish and one of my main problems is that I'm not that familiar with contemporary writers who write in Spanish. So I looked at El País list just to get some suggestions and I decided to begin with their number one novel, Yubia Fina. I must say though that I was underwhelmed by this family drama. The novel it's about siblings who all belong to this middle class, lower middle class slash working class family in Madrid. 
I couldn't empathize with anything that was going on. I didn't care. I tried to invest myself in the novel, but find it a struggle. I was reading against the grain, really trying to get interested in something that I really was not interested in. But I thought it was well written. It did not, unfortunately, make me want to go back and read more books by Luis Landero. This was hailed as one of his best novels and definitely his best novel in a while. So that kind of put me off going back and finding more books by him. And finally, The Breast by Philip Roth. This is a novella. Again, I've read quite a few novellas in November. That probably accounts for the fact that I read a lot of books, but you know, I didn't read all of these books in January. I finished them in January. I often read several books at the same time. And you know, I combine longer with shorter books. So you would have noticed that I've read a lot of novellas. So that's also an easy way to read a lot of books in just one month. Not that I do it like that on purpose. It just works out that way. So anyway, The Breast by Philip Roth. Imagine the metamorphosis, right? So you have Gregor Samsa. One day he wakes up as a bug and then he faces the rejection of everyone who allegedly loves him. Okay, so what would happen if instead of a cockroach or a bug, this character, in this case, his name is not Gregor Samsa. We're in America and the name of the character is David Kapesh. So one day he becomes a giant breast, a giant female breast, but he faces the same kind of reactions than, um, that Gregor Samsa has to face in Metamorphosis, in the Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka. So I thought this was a great Fun. This was great fun. This was uh, a really good book to read, to have a good time reading it. If you just want to do that, then I suggest you pick up The Breast by Philip Roth. So these are all the books that I finished reading in January 2020. What books did you read last month? And also, have you read any of the books that I discuss in this video? Please let me know in the comment section down below. And please don't forget to subscribe to my channel, Bookish Islander, if you've liked what you've seen here. I hope to see you again very soon. Bye bye.